Great. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks, everyone. Um, good evening. Thanks for having me here. As I just mentioned, I work for NOAA, which is not short for to no avail. It is National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. I'm going to talk a little bit about what we do and what we think about in terms of climate. We've heard a lot of impacts. We're going to talk a little bit about what that means in the context of the Pacific Northwest. What it means on islands. I'm from an island. Everybody ever heard about Boulder, Colorado? That's an island <laughs> in the Front Range with its own foreign policy and military force. But I also grew up <laughs> in an island in the Caribbean. And we'll talk about some of the work we're doing down in those areas. And now I know you expect, whenever somebody's speaking, you expect them to drone on interminably, so I won't disappoint you there. The <laughs> idea here, as we think through some of these things, start at, we'll start asking some questions. What does it take to bring about change that is not just incremental? And how do we do that in a way that meets the needs of a broad public with many different views about what we want to do and how we think? So, change is ahead, however derived. You don't need to be the Dalai Lama to know that life's about change. The idea, though, is what can we say about it? Here's an actual headline. It says, experts say rainfall may lessen drought. <laughs> Good job to have, right? <laughs> I'm going to give credit to a lot of victims here. Nick Bond, who's a Washington State climatologist we work very close with. Amy Snow, University of Washington, Denise Langfilmo from the Oregon State. We helped set up, years ago, I helped set up the center at the University of Washington and then the one in Oregon that works on climate impacts in the region. Paula Kehoe from the San Francisco Public Utilities. Richard Feely, who does most of the mapping of ocean acidification and coral reefs around the world. And a whole host of others. So whenever there's something that you don't like, I have somebody to blame. And it's key to have a list of partners such as that. So what do we know about the observed physical changes? This is something that people come, you know, second nature to everyone. But what I like to do is this. This is the data. If I have to do a hearing or something like that and somebody says, well, I don't believe it's changing, I go, where's your data, right? And so the idea is, this is the nature of the data. It's not the stock market in most cases because you could see the arrows up. But temperature over oceans, there's no question. Humidity, no question. Why is that important? Nighttime humidity is the thing that drives a lot of vector-borne, a lot of diseases, right? Like Zika. Temperature over land, ocean heat content, all of these are in the data that they're changing. They're not all anthropogenically caused. They're not all caused by humans, but it is changing. So the question is, what do we do knowing that? So as we begin to think through this and stuff we do on things like the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, we know that a changing climate leads to changes in extreme events. But what do we know about the future? Whenever somebody asks me, oh, how can you tell me about you know, five years from now, but you can't tell me what the weather will be like three weeks from now, I tell them, I'm making a forecast. Next winter will be colder than next summer. <laughs> it's one year from now, and I'm telling you what it's going to be like. So there are some things that we understand, and there's a good reason why we do, and the physics behind it, the dynamics. But the question everyone always has on his or her mind is, so what? So what if we know that? If I'm in your way and you're not seeing clearly or hearing what I'm saying, you're the one of the lucky ones. OK. So here's the past decade, right? 2000 to 2009. The conditions relative to the century before that, you can see where things are drying out, and it's reliably dry in the Mediterranean, uh, certainly the southwest, parts of South America. But over the place that we are now, there's a mixed signal. Right? It's very hard to understand this for a lot of folks because it's not reliably drying, nor is it reliably getting wetter. What that means is that surprises are in store. In some ways, that could be worse simply because we don't know what it is. But let's think through what that means into the future. There's what we're projecting from you know, 2090, 2099, just based on temperature, the one thing we can reliably project. right? So a question is whether or not that's where we're heading is what do we do in the meantime? 
Right? That's the fair question. In the context of all the things that we're engaged in, on efficiency, on uh, land use, on water supply, let's think about what that means in getting from 2000 to 2090 and not producing a world in which we're not sort of making viable, system, viable systems for our economies, for our communities, and for the environment. So let's see how we go through some of this thinking. Because a lot of the climate stuff will be very familiar to you, to this audience. I know people have seen a lot of that stuff before. And some of the other things that I might say might even be more obvious. So here's the idea. We have multiple threats. People know this. Warming, sea level rise, ocean acidification, agricultural runoff, fishing, tourism, and hipsters. You have multiple benefits. Climate resilience, ecosystem services, biodiversity, a lot of different issues in which the threats are there, but the actions that we can take can lead to multiple benefits. We don't need to know the future precisely in order to plan for a changing world or in order to make a better world. So let's think through this. There's adaptation actions occurring across the world, and one of my jobs were with the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change was to assess where are these working and how do you know? We did a lot of those assessments in the United States, in the Caribbean and elsewhere, and focused on what is happening in life and property, in health, in agriculture, in hydropower, in infrastructure, environment, aviation, construction. And we asked the question, what is being done and how are we learning to adapt and adjust in each of these cases? I'm going to come back to what that means in the context of islands. So what if we know this? <laughs> Clearly, the Romans ignored one of the early IPCC reports because of deferred maintenance, right? Again, knowing is not the same as doing, right? We know a lot of stuff, yet our actions are not commensurate with knowing those things. So let's think through how we jump that bridge there, right? Between knowing and the actions that we take with the knowledge that we have. As the old pirate adage goes, first pillage, then burn. Don't go the other way around. <laughs> right? There's the Pacific Northwest temperature, the difference from 1950 to 1999. And for low CO2 emissions into the future, that's the yellow, and the reddish looking ones for high CO2. So what if temperature changes? Folks in the audience will know, what is the difference in temperature between the Earth now and at the height of the last ice age on average? Five degrees C. Not a lot. Because what it takes to heat the oceans, the land and the atmosphere, is a lot of heat. Five degrees might not sound much, but that was the, the difference in the global planetary temperature between now and the Ice Age. That gives you a sense of one or two degrees means something in the context of the atmosphere. There, we know that this has an impact on things like ocean acidification. Folks in the room are probably very familiar with that. The idea that adding CO2 to the oceans actually makes the water a little bit more acidic, then breaks down aragonite, the things that bind corals. So we develop a lot of maps on where these things are. There are a lot of work, some of you would have seen, on sea level rise estimates and what might happen into the future in changing flood risks in cities around the United States. But what I'm going to focus on, and this is some of the stuff we do, is really asking the question, what does it mean in the context of water and planning? One of the major things around the world, and why I showed you that map about 2099 and 2000 to 2009, I grew up in the Caribbean. He says, hurricanes, that's your issue, right? It's not. It's water. Water is the major concern of folks in the Caribbean because the tourism industry and its demand for water during the driest time of the year, which is when it's sunny and which is when you have you know, sun, sand, and surf, actually creates demands on the system. And you have to meet those demands. It's the basis of the economy. It's actually water. Water is the biggest driver of adaptation and planning and practice in island environments. And I'm going to come back to talk about why that is. So there's the Pacific Northwest in the past. What are we seeing? 1871 to 1970 is in blue. 1980 to 2012, temperature has shifted to be warmer over the past century. There's no question about that. Anybody that says otherwise, show me your data, right? 
It's made up of a set of different things. What it tells us though, temperatures are expected to increase two to five degrees Fahrenheit in the Pacific, but we're not sure about precipitation. But there's something that's been happening that I'll speak to in a second. In many parts of the Southwest and elsewhere, just the temperature signal has been overwhelming the precipitation. What does that mean? It means it's drying out, right? In other words, you can get 100% of precip, which we did in 2004, 2005 in the Colorado Basin, and got 70% of the runoff because it was warmer than normal in the spring of that time of the year. Evaporation, right? The aerial extent of the United States in, 19, in 2012, the drought aerial extent jumped from 30% to 60% between May and July, a matter of a few months, simply because it was warmer than normal. The, Warmer atmosphere started pulling water out of the vegetation. The Colorado River, 14 million acre feet, loses 2 million acre feet a year to evaporation. So there's a big issue concerning just the temperature signal. Is all of that temperature signal because of humans? No. That's what makes it scary. Because if it is, then we know something about how to stop all of it. But since it's partly human, partly natural, what you get is a surprise in the system, something we cannot fully predict. And so we can talk about what does that mean to do. So in the water sector, there's climate impacts, drawdown and turbidity, climate impacts on water quality and temperature, and on our assets and infrastructure, the things that drive our economy and our ways of knowing how we develop culture and practices over time. So we're going to speak a little bit to what that actually means in the context of adaptation. There's a figure you may have seen, the changes projected for 2040 in runoff, brown area about minus 50%. This is all based on, a tem on temperature projections impacting snowpack. Not a whole lot out in the middle here in the plains. You have, you know, my wife's family lives out in Yakima, Washington. You can see some of that, but mostly along the Cascades, you're actually seeing changes in precipitation, right? Projected into the future. Here's actually what we're seeing at the present and what this means in terms of our thinking. There's the observed springtime snow melt dates. When the onset of spring runoff has started, everyone in this room knows how important that is to salmon and hydropower, right? The trade-offs on when the flushing flows come down during spring, what you manage for hydropower, and what you rush through the system to get the younger fish out through the Col Columbia and elsewhere. Significant trends towards onset more than 20 days earlier. People go, yeah, great, so what? We have more water, right? You don't. Whenever water comes down at a high rate, we let it through the system because of flood risk. You can't store that water. Right? So we're seeing earlier runoff, and people in this room know that, but what does that mean in the context of planning? We're seeing snow melt run off earlier. Managing that for agriculture, things that have been tuned to seasons, makes it very difficult to change our operating systems and our planning over time. So let's think of what that means. People remember us calling the Godzilla El Nino, right? It was fighting the blob in the North Pacific. You might have seen that in the news. One of the things that happened during the Godzilla El Nino and the blob was a huge ocean heat wave in this north area that migrated along the coast, the west coast of the United States. What did it do? There's the warm and wet, 2015. What we saw was what we're calling a snow drought, right? <coughs> What's a snow drought? It means you get 100% of precipitation, but only 25% of it or so is snowpack. But all of our systems are tuned in the West, I live in Colorado, are tuned to having snowpack to manage through the spring and summer and into the fall. By April 1, which is a key date in the snowpack measurement, snowpack was only 25% because it had run off, the rain had run off through the system. That's exactly the type of thing we would expect in a warming environment. Snow not falling as snow, but falling as rain changing the dynamics of the way our hydrology works and the way in which we plan water, but we haven't adapted and adjusted to that over time. There is no new normal. We're not there yet. 
So the question is, how do we ad adapt and adjust as we learn? A lot of things happened that year, in the past year. This is an older figure. We're just uh, adjusting. We're just fixing it right now, updating it. There's the catch and maximum potential compared to the, the present in 2050. This is in terms of maximum catch potential of fish. Off the coast, you can see changes in some of the key fishing areas in the world. It's one of the big changes that we don't fully understand. One of the ones we do understand is how we've intervened in water systems on the planet. There's dam and reservoir construction in 1800, 1900, although I guess in 1800, yeah, 1950, 2000. We've changed the hydrology of our systems while the oceans now are themselves changing over time. The oceans drive about half of our climate right now. So what is it? It's a problem of scale. When we think through <laughs> what it means for adapting and adjusting our systems, and we move from the single fish to the school, we have to ask, what's the system and the set of regulations and rules and management under which we act? And how does that change that link between the number of dams and the changes we're seeing in the ocean? There are about s over 70 jurisdictions that a single salmon passes through. About 70, right? So it's something to keep in mind when we say, hey, wow, it's stuff's changing. Why don't we do something about it? Each of these has its own goals, mandates, and we all work right, on, in institutions like those. So, yes? Yeah, actually, we account for methane in um, methane emissions from wetlands, potential estimates from peatlands, and from reservoirs. Yeah, just all those yeah. for, our uh, salmon. for the big salmon, right? Everywhere so, there are several things going on yeah. on methane. Yeah, yeah, there are, and I'll get to some of this. But I just wanted to point out that when we ask why is what we know not always commensurate with what we do. It doesn't always have to be that we don't agree on what we know. It actually has to do a lot with the variety of institutions we put into place and our perception of risk over time. So let's think through this. What do we want, right? Pathways that lower resilience or pathways that increase resilience? And which pathway are we going to pick? And which institutions do we have that helps us think through how we adapt and adjust over time? To a higher resilient world or a lower resilient world. We need help in thinking about the barriers to action. One of the barriers is having only a near-term focus, right? The near-term focus is the bridge is out ahead, because that's way off into the future. But we're very certain that the shine has sharp edges. And we tend to focus on what's in the near term, right? We acknowledge the uncertainties, focus on improving decisions in the near and long term. That's a barrier. So I'm going to ask folks in the audience when we're done, how? How do we move ahead on asking that we not have simply a near term? And the key here is you have to be both near and long term, right? But I'm going to ask a little bit about that. What's another barrier that we have? If only could, we could assess future risks with greater certainty. New York Times in California, right? Do we have to really assess great risks with greater certainty? Can we tell which way this is going? So some of these things are prefigured, right? We don't need to really understand the fifth decimal point in an un inconsequential number to understand where we might be going. Is, as I like to say, there's an old Chinese saying, if we're not careful, we might end up where we're going. In this context, getting at some of those questions become very, very important. We have a strong risk of underestimating the potential for adaptation. The third one is adaptation will cost us, right? Anything we plan now is an upfront cost, and it's going to reduce our productivity and our well-being. There's GDP, and there's U.S. water withdrawals. Since 1975, the U.S. as a whole has been using less water in total, not per capita, in total. But it hasn't affected GDP. So when we say, well, what, what in heaven's name, if you're asking me to adapt and adjust, 
It's going to take some upfront costs, and in the long term, it's going to damage the economy. There's a lot of errors, and energy is one in which we have very similar graphs and charts that show that the actions that you take actually does not affect the economy in the way that we're thinking. So we have to ask the question, how real are those barriers that we're posing, right? That it's costing us, and I always like to tell people, if you have 1960, the ref you have a refrigerator from 1960, it's louder, it's less efficient, really, really, it didn't work very well. The ones we have now are way more efficient. Our well-being is a whole lot better for having more efficient refrigerators, and it actually improved people's well-being. So the question is, how do we get past this notion that those fundamental barriers to thinking about what we do about climate are in fact not permanent barriers, right? The costs, short-term thinking, right? and the fact that you do not have to affect your present well-being negatively in order to plan for the future. This is a critical concern across all of our adaptation communities, right? And a big one, do we really need to know the future so precisely in order to act. We buy insurance, right? How did that come about? Efficient technology and behavioral changes work. That's why that graph looks that way. There was no loss of economic competitiveness. So we're dealing with a set of myths. There's an old saying, there's a famous, famous, uh, not Socrates, a different philosopher. His name was Satchel Page once said, <laughs> uncertainty is not what you don't know, it's what you know that isn't so. What you've come to learn over time to be true that is no longer true. Why is that important? Because the first thing people will tell you is, oh, it's upfront cost and well-being. Well, not if you really look at the data and numbers. So how are islands different? Well, there's Barbados, growth along the coast. All of our islands have finite ecological and environmental resources. They're geographically constrained. I always like to tell people, and they say, well, you know, if, if sea level is riding, you need to migrate away from the coast. Well, if you migrate away from this coast, you're on that coast, <laughs> on an island. Demographic changes, economic and the historical and political developments that have taken place over time. We're all similar in island environments along those dimensions. This is a little complicated number, we're updating it, but the reason why I wanted to show you was this. The top 20 countries vulnerable to natural hazards, depending on your percent of GNP, there's a list of them, Vanuatu, Burkina Faso, Ethiopia, then you ask population affected over that 20 year period, 700%, in other words, if you accumulate it each year, 20%, but here's the key thing. When you say, what's the number of disasters relative to land area, all of them but one are islands. All of them but one are islands. Islands are, in fact, different in terms of adaptation. Gambia is the only country, and we just updated this, it's virtually the same, because the concentration of hazards that affect a landslide and a flood affects the entire island. Hurricane Ivan hit Grenada right, in 2012. Damage to the economy was 210%. Right? It's overwhelming in the context of islands. So we know what we ought to do. There's a bunch of stuff that we've worked on out of the IPCC, risk factors of shore erosion, saline water intrusion, people are familiar with that, coastal populations, tourism economies. What do you do? Early warning systems, maintenance of drainage, risk pooling, relocation. But there's something, as I mentioned, that's driving all islands, which is water. There's the freshwater lens of a typical small, low-lying island. High pumping rates, introduces more salt water into the nearshore aquifer. Everybody in this room who lives on an island knows that. Right? It's exactly what we're facing for these small economies across the world. But my point is that it's not all bad. Right? Apparently, grapes are gonna do really well at high elevation. And as I like to tell people when I study, you know, look at the impacts on climate and wine, I'm a proponent of what's called case studies. Right? Anyway, so the idea, as you begin to think through this, is just as I showed the GDP versus water development, let's ask, where's the openings? Where are the openings for us thinking through positively? What are the effective climate change adaptations that lead us to a more vibrant world? 
One of the things I helped develop for the Caribbean was a special program on adaptation to climate change. National Water Commissions estimate the tourism sector requires 10 times more water per capita than the domestic sector. So we began to start efforts to, in the island of Dominica, St. Lucia, right? Martinique and elsewhere, I'm gonna to speak to St. Lucia and a very small island called Bequi. Anybody familiar with this little island called Mustique? It's where Mick Jagger hangs out, right? You've seen Mick anytime? I was once in a stadium with Mickey, he was on stage, yeah. Okay, so the idea though, what's being done in these small economies to try to get at this? This is a set of efforts we've had. Public-private partnerships on one case in St. Lucia, the Coconut Bay Resort, that's what it looks like. Pretty nice place. We introduced a rainwater harvesting system and sewage treatment for recycling and landscaping, saving about three million liters a day 21 million liters annually, given the peak of the tourism season. This is now being exported to different parts of the Caribbean in terms of the efficiency of recycling and harvesting rainwater. What else are we looking at? On the area of, in the island of Bequia, renewable energy systems powering a, powering a reverse osmosis desal plant. What's the biggest cost in desal plants? Energy. The disposal of effluent and energy are the two biggest concerns in diesel. We're able to set up a diesel plant that is fully powered by solar energy to do its osmosis. It was the winner of the Energy Globe National Award in 2015. In the airport, you have the, the, you got the power plant, there's the community that it's serving, about a thousand people, and there basically is where you have the osmosis desal plant. Right? Why is that important to show? Because the scale does not affect greatly the aesthetics of the place. Because one of the big issues, as people in this room know, we have with renewables, especially wind energy and solar, is especially in tourism economies, people go, whoops, don't want to see it. Right? Because it affects whether or not people visit your area. The size of this facility is not large and it has been used to actually power desal plants based on solar energy. But what we know about desal is this. It's great for potable water. It will not fix water needs for agriculture, for the environment. So we'll never be able to produce that scale. And so one of the things we've been doing, and this is led by some friends of mine in Barbados, is about 80% of the houses now in Barbados, their water heaters are solar powered. Pretty dramatic for a small island, right? Innovations coming from places you might not have thought it possible. Let's come back to the United States and some colleagues at the San Francisco Public Utilities. Up to 95% of demands are non-potable in commercial buildings, right? Why is that? The public utilities started to look before the drought about how they might be able to retrofit buildings to be able to make the greatest use of non-potable water. This is one of the biggest savings ahead of the drought that happened. Basically, you have precipitation collected from roofs above grades, precipitation collected at or below grade, nuisance groundwater, wastewater from clothes and washers, and they began to rebuild. There is the municipal building. There's the top of it in San Francisco. Reimagining how water is used, rethinking building design even before a drought hit. And as a result, the installation of on-site water systems is a requirement for every large office building in San Francisco. So it's optimistic, right? From the smallest islands to one of the world's great cities, people are able to make changes. The person that led this, Paula Key, who is just one of the most amazing people you'll ever meet, because she got this done before a drought happened, started building this into the process, telling them that, look, we experienced droughts before, we're gonna be able to work with the public and private sector. And the most important thing here was that working with the health sector, they were able to let the health folks monitor the quality of the water and let the private sector manage its own water. 
making sure that there's water in the system for the environment and other things that we need. It's really a good case. Where else are we seeing innovations? One of the best climate change plans in the country, if not the world, we've assessed most of these across the world, is the Swinomish Climate Initiative, right here. It's one of the most best designed in terms of thinking. Innovations coming from everywhere. There's my friend James rattling me from Fort Peck. There are changes coming from everywhere, but what are we learning? Drought hits harder in already dry Indian country. So a colleague of mine, Gary Collis, said, with drought, tribes are first affected and most affected, the ones who experience the seasons the most. So colleagues of mine went out using our funding and asked people, how are things changing? You heard today the importance of elders in different communities. Right? Who we listen to? Grandmothers are extremely important here. Today there's less rain, climate has gotten drier. Testing and linking what people know and experience is how humans think, not just folks in tribes. That's how we all think. And what we've been able to do with a lot of this is be able to map the changes that people have been experiencing with what we're seeing in climate. And as a result, we got into the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the first statement on the value of using local and indigenous knowledge to change how we adapt. Not simply saying, oh, the tribal people are affected, oh, how bad, what do we do about it? But really taking the lessons from how we've adapted and adjusted in small scale activities over time to learn how to adapt. First report to ever do that was this weathering uncertainty thing that we released, I was one of the authors on this, that basically showed not how people were simply affected, but what the stories they tell and the work they were doing on tribal lands, how that actually changed their vulnerability. In other words, where we can learn from. Of course, I was up on, on Hopi Nation a few years ago, and this friend of mine, his dad is the rain priest, and I was at one of the rain dances, and he said, I said, so how's it work, right? You know, and he said, uh, how's it work, young man? Yeah, I said, how's it work? I mean, and by that I meant, you know, given the myths and culture and tradition, who are you calling and how does this, you know, in, in Aztec culture, the chakmul goes to the cloud and ca carries a message. He said, let me tell you how it works. Do it just before it rains. <laughs> he said, that's the secret to making it work. Of course, the other thing he told me was we were starting the adaptive management program on the Colorado and you guys may have heard about, you know, releasing things from Glen Canyon to try and recover the dam. And he looked at the Secretary of um, the Interior. He said, so this is adaptive management. This is when it started 20 years ago. I was involved in some of the forecasting. He said, this is adaptive management? He said, yeah. So what's it about? He said, it's um, you know, being able to sustain your livelihood. He said, we've been here for 10,000 years. Yeah. <laughs> you guys just showed up. <laughs> yeah. all right? So it's a way of thinking and how we learn. And we all have experiences like that. What else is happening? One of my close colleagues, Lee Welling, we're celebrating 100 years of the Park Service. She's doing a lot of work around the country. She works for the Park Service, leading their climate efforts to look at how we empower park managers to act on climate change, to be able to think through scenarios into the future for planning. This is well documented, completely concrete, and being used in parks in different parts of the country. Scenarios help Assateague Island explain the need for flexible infrastructure to uncover groundwater, helping the park understand and explain unusual patterns. So there's a lot that's happening. America's greatest idea, right? It has to stay the greatest idea. And the idea is in a changing environment. How are we working to incorporate that information into planning and practice? But what we have is what I call the hydroelogical cycle. It's different from the hydrologic cycle, right? In where we experience an event, such as drought, we're very concerned, got to act, and then it rains. And so a lot of our work is focused on breaking this cycle, keeping us in a state of understanding that constant work, constant vigilance is needed to manage as we change over time. So what are some lessons? I like to call them lessons drawn, not necessarily learned, because we don't learn all of them. One is this. It's important not to be overconfident, right? And I said uncertainty is what you know that isn't so. Here's the cat, the cat's going, let me do my scientific analysis. I'll get some universities behind it, they'll do anything I pay them to do. That's a bird, I've caught birds before. Birds have beaks, that has a beak, I can catch this. 
this is a different bird, right? The deceptiveness about climate change is that it's about droughts, it's about floods, it's about wildfire, it's about wave energy. It looks like something we know how to do, but it's a different bird. Cat is going, I can take you, and the eagle is going, what the hell are you thinking, all right? That's the nature of overconfidence. Our key question is, how often and when should we revise our assumption? How do we move from planning to implementation, this is what all those cases I've showed are doing, ensuring resilient communities, supporting livability, and promoting resilience at the same time, and then putting the pieces together. There are cases around the world that we can draw from, several of them here as well, that shows us how to integrate these pieces in ways that help us manage our future. And the most important thing is not communication, it's coordination, right? That is why we lift on three. I'm sure she told the, doc or he told the doctor, told the orderlies, we're gonna lift on three, right? There, I've communicated what we ought to be doing. But of course, the end result is that coordination is even more important than communication. So what is resilience? Let's see if I can get this. I'm about, as I begin to wrap up, I'm not really wrapping up. When I say that, it gives the moderator some confidence that something is happening. It's, so, oh crap. Okay, who does PCs here? This is Seattle, I work on a Mac. Okay, so can you just start 53? I wanna show you something. Yeah, you're gonna put it back in uh, slide mode. All right, and then press some. Um, just bring it over here, you'll see. No, that's not what I want, I want the slide before that. This, this, just bring it to the, yeah. It should open up the slide. For the video. Yeah, for the video. Oh, yeah, Is it? Yeah, just press that arrow. Yay! So communities across the country are increasingly vulnerable, but there are things we can do, right? To long-term changes over time. Our ability to withstand and recover is called resilience. Everybody in this room knows that. What I've been trying to show you is that societies have it, organizations have it, the environment has it, but the choices we make and the organizations we put into place are the ones that lead to resilience, right? Understanding risk, preparing today, can in fact have positive outcomes. We don't have to throw our hands up in the air. Right? The specific cases that produce economic benefit and our marine life and habitat, it's not good to play dice with Mother Nature. Right. I think the, the sound isn't on, but that's all right. So. so I just wanted to be clear that the way we're approaching this is making sure that the public science and the things that people fund our citizens fund are playing a role in how we adapt into the future. The idea, is we're all in this together, right? But there's something about that, which is even the littlest amongst us know that a little collaboration will get you some water. So as we begin to think through where we go with the idea of climate and how we move forward, I want to thank a certain person who passed away this year. His name is Edward Miles. Ed was a professor at the University of Washington for about 30 years, if not longer. He led the Climate Impacts Group, basically creating most of what you see in terms of climate information in the Pacific Northwest for planning and management. He was also from the same island I was from in the Caribbean. So thank you very much for listening. Right. As we begin to think through this, I'd certainly like to talk a little bit in the time we have remaining on how we actually link what we know with what we do in ways that meet a vibrant future for our communities and for the environment. Thanks a lot.
I showed you some fish. <laughs> I showed you some fish migrating in oceans. So, so one of the things is this, right? You have the changes that are occurring. In fact, right now, what we're seeing are species of butterflies that are much further north than they have been. And I, had, I took out a bunch of that stuff, a bunch of things on the die-off of, um, of you know, pinion juniper in the southwest. But there's something more important here, right? Which is showing that valuing those ecosystems are in fact the thing that provides the buffers for adaptations over choice, right? That's exactly what we work on. So one of the things in, in, as we're seeing here is remember what, what we're asking, right? You can ask, how do we find water for humans to use? What's the corollary to that? So that less water is taken out of the environment. Right? This is exactly the focus that we have. You meet the economic needs on one side, otherwise you're gonna lose both of those things. Right? So the idea here is not simply to come up with some you know, um, economic value of ecosystems or anything like that, but basically to show the extent to which our adaptation mechanisms are heavily reliant on protected areas and conserved areas. And that's exactly what we're doing in the context of fisheries, in the context of habitat, and in the context of protected areas. There are tons of cases that I can point you to that we're engaged in on landscape. There's a richer point there, which is this. In the disaster risk reduction community, they'll tell you that one dollar in retrofitting your building relative to um, a windstorm or a flood will give you about a dollar and 50 cents in benefit if something happens. One dollar invested in landscape maintenance gives you six to seven dollars in terms of return. So there's the economic argument, but as I've been saying all along, it's not necessarily true that the economic argument drives the day. So the value of ecosystems are critical in the context of the buffers that we have and in the context of protecting those species themselves. What's the most, anybody have an idea as to what's the major conservation uh, adaptation program we've had in the United States that's been sustained for decades now? The Conservation Reserve Program in the US Department of Agriculture. The fact that you put something aside and you leave it so that you can in fact have a buffer in the system. That's been the, since the Dust Bowl. My concern are species that can't tolerate this change in one or 2% or they sit there for decades. Yeah. 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 I don't think you're managing it. I think here's, here's the thing, right? This is why, while adaptation is really important, without some measure of mitigation to reduce thresholds, right? Coral reefs live in a very, very narrow threshold. The majority of fish kills that have happened in the Columbia Basin have been as a result of high temperatures, getting summertime temperatures and water that are over 21 degrees C. You manage that kind of stuff through better riparian practice, right? And that's what the state of Oregon is doing right now. When it comes to things like coral reef and acidification, it's only really a mitigation problem. So, but what I want to keep in mind is, you know, as I show you some of these things, a lot of our adaptation practices are grounded in the fact that the sustainability, what we call in engineering system decompensation, that reducing the capacity of ecosystems reduces the capacity to respond. And we can say that, but unless you actually show it in a way that people's lives are grounded in it. Everybody's familiar with the Northwest Power Planning Act of 1980, one of the most innovative things that ever happened in terms of managing resources. How well, how well it works is a whole other question. A lot of things that drove that was Cecil Andrus wrote a letter called The Fish of Memory, in which he basically said, both sides of the aisle and everybody else, look, we all used to go. 
catch fish. We all used to go take our children, do all these different things. Don't we want to continue doing that? That played a bigger role in influencing the creation of the Northwest Planning Act than any of the economic arguments on power, hydropower versus salmon. So, so we have to understand what actually appeals to people in the context of their own environments and how they come to know where they are. So it's a good question. So I thought we had one here and then, oh, did you move? Right, and then, then we come, right, yeah. Oh, I know. Yeah. 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 I I fully agree. I got in, involved in the '90s in salmon for that reason here. So certainly Salmon River, Salmon River, the Salmon River case. Yeah, we supported it big time. So right. So I'll talk to him the next time I see him. The idea, right? But they don't like to do a lot of stuff before they don't like to do a lot of stuff before they leave office, right? But here's the thing about that, right? We know the value that some of us are after. Unless you ground it in the thing I was saying relative to like what Cecil Andrus and those people were doing, unless you do it, these are short-term fixes. We can all agree on, oh yeah, we ought to do the X or Y. But honestly, unless you have broader based support, these things do not last. Right? That's just the nature of the way, that's just the nature, you remember the old, the old saying, right? Success is 97% luck, 2% persistence, and 2% attention to detail. <laughs> anyway, but the, the, the issue here is this. In, unless we're appealing to the type of values I was just mentioning, no amount of arguing about the rightness of the position changes people's mind because they are sure that they're right as well. And as, there's another old saying, right? There's another old saying which is, win-win situations, when you find them, usually the winner is not, the loser is not at the table or is on the menu. Right? <laughs> so we always have to ask when we see some of these, whether or not we're actually benefiting all of the people who are involved. So, yes, oh sorry, we were there. Right. Worse when there's linear change, and when it comes to accelerating, yes. it seems it's hopeless. So, one of the reasons why I put up these sort of barriers is to get this sort of discussion of the kind we're asking. Yes, if we know what we ought to do, what stops us from doing it? The major challenge we have um, was the future shock guy who just passed away not long ago, right? Alvin um, Toffler had a major statement, right? He says, "It is not the change itself." but the rate of change defines the problem. Why is that important? Because that's when we act, right? That's the time when we act. And what we're trying to do by pointing out some of these cases is in fact show that human adjustment and human response can happen at a rate of change that is slightly faster than the change in the environment. Now, absolutely right. Uh, now, what I wouldn't say, you know, I once th thought about being a pessimist and I thought that's not gonna work, but the idea, is this, I think we have cases that show that we can in fact make action happen. But what we have to show is this, that the well-being of others and of communities are not negatively affected by, short, by upfront costs. And we have a set of those to show. Why is that important? We all believe that those actions have negative upfront costs to us an investment, a sense of well-being, when in fact in the long term, and it doesn't have to be too long term, you can see pretty clear, GDP was going up as fast as we were reducing water use. 
So I'm not as hopeless, in a sense, right? There's a friend of mine, a, a well-known historian, uh, Patty Lamricky, likes to say, you know, if, um, if we didn't change, you know, in the 1920s, if I said, I'm a lawyer for the wolves, I'm gonna go, which, what part of Mars are you from? And what, but you can say that now. And your point is well taken. It is, in fact, can and do we change at a rate that is acceptable, but also slightly faster than the changes in the environment. So it's a well taken point. And that's why I raise the barriers. Rather than giving you another talk about, here's the trend in CO2, and here's everything that you know, I wanted to pose to you questions about, well, here are the cases. What scales these up? So, uh, so it's a great question. Like, So it's a good question. Happened in um, 1975, actually, is when things change. Yeah, it was a little earlier than, okay. yeah. So, but here's the issue, right? Because you could see that change over time, right? What was happening is what things were in place before that. And a lot of it had to do with having periods of drought that were really bad, right? But also having technology ready, but more importantly, the behavioral acceptance to adopt and adapt those technologies to use. And a lot of that was going on before this happened. There's a reason why we got things like, you know, um, the ESA Environmental Act around that time, right? They helped precipitate those changes. The key, however, is that technology, as everybody in this room knows, technology by itself does nothing unless behavior changes along with it. And that's actually what was happening at the time. So great question. So, sure. um, so Roger, you've looked at all these case studies of I, I've even worked on some of them. Right. Yeah. So, so. And, and we, we call them positive deviants, for example. Is there anything? I'm, I'm a bit of a deviant. Go on. <laughs> is so. there anything that is characteristic? Are there any it's a good question, criteria right? criteria that you could say so. it takes this before people right. will do this? This is an excellent question because it links back to yours. What makes people change over time? Everywhere that we've looked, things that have had, for want of a better word, you know, looking at adaptive management, where these watershed plans, let's say, have worked, you've had a couple things happening. You've had an event of some kind, and it doesn't have to be a physical event like a drought or a flood, right? Uh, one of my mentors, a guy by the name of Gilbert White, uh, the idea that you use soft paths to manage floods came out of his work on the Mississippi in the 30s and 40s. We take that for granted now, right? Yeah, sure, wetlands, all that. Comes out of single people's work based on those flood events. You need the public and leadership engaged at the same time. At the same time. Because I can show you cases that we've looked at of hurricanes that impacted the East Coast and led to no changes in laws or in planning. But then I could show you hurricanes of the same size that led to those things. All right? So you need public leadership and engaged at the same time. It has to be a collaborative basis for social cooperation. People have agreed. I'll give you the best case of this. What is the most contentious watershed in the United States? It ain't in the West. It's not the Klamath. It's not. It is the Apalachicola Chattahoochee Flint in Florida, Georgia, and Alabama. When I showed up at the meeting there the first time, see if the mic is still on, they were armed. Guys, show, they don't. We have learned for 120 years in the West that doesn't work as well. <laughs> anymore, right? We learn to play a little better in many ways, even though, you know, the National Guard has been called out by Arizona on the co uh, b between uh, U.S., uh, between Arizona and California. ACF, because uh, Georgia at the top has Atlanta, and down below has some shellfish producers, and it's the trade-off between those. It's the most contentious watershed, most litigious watershed in the country right now. And they, when we first started working, they refused to sit with each other at the table. The governor at the time said to me, and we were trying to talk about the drought, and he said the whole issue was the, the reservoir, Lake Lanier, was not built for water for Atlanta. But Atlanta started taking water from it as it was growing. And the first thing he came in and said and started the meeting, he said, we're not going to talk about how much water Atlanta should or should not take from Lake Lanier, but let's fix this water shortage puppy, right? So he threw out the biggest driver, 
and then you have to ask the question, how do we act? So you have a focus event, public and leadership are engaged at the same time, a basis for collaboration. In other words, people have either sued each other to the point at which, uh, I'll get, not many people know this, the upper Colorado, right? Wyoming, Colorado, Utah has a water commission. The lower Colorado does not because they don't agree on how they should be managing that basis. The second thing is a collaborative framework between research and management. Something that says, like I was saying, wow, is GDP really going up? Is this technique working? Would this information have helped me in a past event? How do I know that? That's one of the things Ed Miles was really good at, is helping develop, and I've worked with them on helping develop these networks of research and management. Right? Only when those are in place have we seen things work. And it's the only thing, right now, a, a well-known uh, person in water, Peter Glick and I are working on a piece that says, do transitions always have to be in the rearview mirror? Do we always have to look back and say, that's when it happened? Because if we have to do that, we'll never get to your point, which is, can they ever happen fast enough that we're able to adjust and adapt, but do it in a way that is sustained and sustainable over the long term, not just to meet the needs of people who think like I do. Basically, those are the things that have driven all the cases we've looked at. The Murray-Darling Basin, which is one of the few watersheds in the world that has money, $3 billion, put aside for envir an environmental right to water during drought. Right? It's one of the few things that actually does that. It's falling apart right now, but hey, the idea was that even getting to that point is a change in the way we think. Did you forget? No, no, no. OK, please. Well, you were talking about the limiting factor of water on islands. And here we have, um, we've got some artesian, we've got uh, pockets in the bedrock that we drill down to. One of the problems that we have is no clear measurement of how much we've got. Because Big most problem. of us who have wells, like mine is quite deep, I don't know how large the pocket is. I don't know right. how much water is right. there. That's a good point. I don't know how old it is. It yeah. could be fossil water. Yeah. No, it's hard to be a good conservationist if you don't know how much you're working. Couldn't agree with you more. I mean, the other side to this is people then go, if you then know, if I have to report that, then it can be managed and regulated. You'll tell me what to do with it. That's the others. So we have to sort of get over that hump as well. Just over two years ago, California passed its first Groundwater Management Act to make sure this was happening. Its first Groundwater Management Act, two years ago, right? First time ever. And everybody's seen Chinatown, right? So it tells you that there's, uh, I always like to tell people when we don't do something, one, we may not have enough information, or two, we don't want to do it, right? And so I actually think unless we have that kind of metering, we won't have a sense of how to manage it, right? But there are certain other things like water for marginal communities, rural farmers, and the environment that have to be separated from that and be given a right to water before we talk about how to measure and manage. So, but it's, it's couldn't agree with you more. It's just a missing thing. There's so little we understand about groundwater even in the Oglala and elsewhere, much less for, for wells. Sir. But to answer her question, I think the water should be, uh, should be a, a way of life. Right, right. Our conservation of water should be a yeah. way of life. It should be something that we should all automatically do, whether regardless of we, whether we have a huge supply mm -hmm. or a small supply, because our, the way that we use water, those lessons are going to be passed on to our children and our grandchildren, and that's what's really important. Like, turn the water when we brush our teeth. I mean, I can go on and on. No, 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 that's... But if we all took on those practices, then it, it wouldn't be an issue of how much water can I use. Yeah. It would just be an issue so. of <coughs> conserving and appreciating the water that we do have. So, given that, right, which I completely agree with, fundamental change, actually, all the things, how these things I pointed out to you become long-term, only happens when that happens. Right? And so the issue is um, what I was trying to show was exactly this. The barriers that we, the excuses we make for why we should not make management in the way you're talking about, a way of life both personally and 
in our institutions fall apart when you look at them in detail. In other words, people will say, like I was telling you, it should be a way of life. There's a culture of risk, there's a culture of management, and unless we're able to say that you know, doing that actually, is, yes, it makes you a better person, but it also does not affect you negatively in the way you think. If we can't do that as well, it'll be one-offs. That's all I'm saying. But what, how you describe how change happens is fundamentally how it has happened in recycling, in everything we've had in terms of equity comes from exactly how you're describing it. And so my issue is, can we build then institutions that, uh, that use this in, at a rate that is slightly faster than the rate at which the environment's changing? And can we make them sustained so that they're not simply turned over the next time somebody who doesn't think like me comes in, right? The way you do that is by getting over those three barriers. But I couldn't agree with you more. And I'm not just agreeing because I'm tired. You know, usually they tell you in these me in, in when you go to one of these um, you know stakeholder meetings, so, you know, consensus happens when we're tired of thinking. Yeah. Right? So, <laughs> but yes, right. But I couldn't agree with you more. That's fundamentally the way of life approach, is it? But people don't like to be lectured on what a way, you know. All right. So the issue is also showing them that the things, the assumptions you're making, fall apart when you look. That's sorry. Yeah. Don't wanna, Quality, yeah. So that we can cut back and reduce the amount of plastics and all yep. the yep. other issues that are adding to the, um, the debris in our oceans and um, et cetera. Absolutely correct, and as such, I'll agree with you. <laughs> so yep. Now, along with yeah. that, yeah. That was them, not me, yeah. but yeah, we just worked with them. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Would I be able then to turn on the tap and safely brush my teeth or get The quality, quality, quality right? So the, 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 the basis of security, whether it's water, food, or whatever, is access, availability, and quality, right? And yes, it's water, the water quality matters. Basically, what you, uh, the best case of that I can point to you is the San Francisco Public Utility was making sure that the water that was recycled in the building was meeting the public level of agreed upon. So we got, I mean, we didn't, but uh, Paul Akiho and the gang there got um, the, basically the health department that the pub, private sector would agree that the health department would be the monitor of their water quality. Yeah, and so we just wrote up something about it that she's in climate change. Sir, sir, sir. I'm at an auction. Yeah. So. Yeah. If it's good, you recalled it right. If it's not, I'm not. Oh, sorry. Go on. Yes. No, it's what what it was was ten times the amount that the country uses, right, for its functioning is consumed by the tourist industry. Yeah, 10 times the amount. So, when you had the, the local populace come together to figure out how they're going to yeah. the water system, how did the tourism factor play into that? The tourism organization is part of the, the group, the Caribbean Tourism Organization. And these are small economies. Green marketing plays a huge seductive role. So, basically, what ended up happening was that by, by through the, the special projects on, on adaptation, funding one of these places first started to create a set of other industry and demands need. Demand needs to be able to market themselves as green. But what the folks did in Coconut Bay was engage the tourism organization right away on a PR, you know, why, it's, why their place has these benefits because they're green. So they're engaged in it anyway. The problem is, and believe it or not, and again, this is why you know, thinking, talk, thinking and talking with people who think the same way we do is all, sometimes deceptive. There's a lot of pushback from individual tourists. What do you mean I'm not gonna 
uh, get my towel washed every day. Right? So that happens as well. But the major thing was marketing with the tourism organization in St. Lucia and marketing this particular location and then the ones that did the same things as green. Played a huge role. Yeah. In? Basically what it was was the, um, the, these guys were saving about 21 million liters of water during the tourist season for each facility. Yeah. Which for them is a lot. So yeah. It's pretty dry islands. Yeah, um, sir, and then, sorry. Do you yeah. have any knowledge then? No. Oh, good. Oh, sorry. About the quality of desalinized water. Yeah, because that's what part of what it was. Uh, yeah. You know, water that comes through earthworm poop. Right, right, right. Yeah. Has all kinds of elements. Yeah, yeah. That I think the body needs. Right. So here's the thing. I know where you're going. I fully agree. What we argue is this. You use desal only to offset shortages, right? Only to offset shortages, not as a primary source. Not as a way of life. Yes. Only to offset shortages, right? We do that with thermal and nuclear and so, right? The, it's, as you were saying, there are things in the environment that you need, right? What was the latest, latest work to um, Kids that grew up with animals, right, are unsusceptible to asthma as kids who haven't, right? So the idea, though, is not pushing these as complete alternatives for all functions so that then you try and maintain the other systems you have. So, but, but the desal water is like distilled water in terms of quality. Right. Yeah. So, sir. Uh, thanks for a great talk. I, uh, thanks. government, uh, first world governments yeah. at least have not dealt ever with externalities yeah. in corporate and We're not good at it. And business yeah. development. Growth is good, growth is not good, and we are overpopulated. So I, I really appreciate your optimism about, about planning and, and the things that you've talked about here in a very thought-provoking way, but I, I just have a big disconnect with the effectiveness of that in a time period that will uh, help us to address climate change right. rapidly enough to make a significant difference. Yeah. So one of the externalities that we have, right, is the idea, as you're saying, you know, we, we don't pay for the negative impacts we have in producing goods and profits and so on in many cases. And the idea for some of this is basically showing that what you're losing is the viability of doing that in the long run. A lot of people don't care about the long run. A lot of people do. I, I once was doing some fisheries work in Chile, and I saw an anchor, right? An anchor that said, basically, Namibia, which was at the time not a country but a province, right? Namibia, 1879, right? You overfish one area, you go to another, you go to another, right? That's how we do a lot of short-term things. From the standpoint of basically the optimism in terms of thinking through some of these, honestly, I'm seeing more people, the world's a different place. I'm seeing more people think in terms of the positive things that they could do. Am I sure this will work? No. Am I sure it will happen on a scale in which we can actually make things better off for everyone? No. However, in 1970, since 1970, the state of California has actually doubled its population. The amount of water in total is actually less than 1970. So in other words, there's such a thing as solving a problem until long, forever, which I don't know that we do. There's something to buying us time. And that's actually the case. California actually for all its problems with agriculture and everything else, uses less water in total, even though its population has doubled. So all I'm saying is there's more flexibility in the system than we're taking advantage of, and there's more ways of getting at that. 
What I'm after is what some of the folks were saying in the background. What do we leave so that when we deal with an uh, uncertain future, we can draw on it? And that we're not really good at. We think efficiency is using everything to the edge. When I started working on salmon, the oceans had changed and we were managing on the Columbia Basin to the very edge. So when the oceans changed, the salmon collapsed. Whereas if we were serious about riparian stuff, if we were serious about migration of salmon, then when the ocean changes, they would be more adaptable on, on the land side as well. And they weren't. The notion that you're getting at, which is efficiency might not mean using everything, is something that's hard for us to learn. And so I'm optimistic in the sense that there are cases like this. Is this how we all think? I don't know that that's true. But I'm, I'm optimistic in the sense that we're getting somewhere. Can we get there fast enough? I don't know. That's part of what we're engaged in. So I'm not backing away from it, but I'm also agreeing with you that I don't know the answer as to how, whether or not we can do this on the scale that we need to. Yeah, there was one, somebody in the back then. Yeah. So it's a good, you know, it's an honest question. That's exactly the kind of question I wanted to provoke in the sense that there are barriers. How do we overcome them? Because if we don't, you don't change. We don't get to something new. Yeah. So desal is becoming a big topic here. Yeah, I heard, yeah. And it's one of the reasons I picked that as a case. Yeah. yeah. And, um, you know, it's so energy intensive, or has been. Yeah, has been, yeah. And um, so if we're faced with a lot of those many desal plants going in, and then our energy consumption going way up when, you know, a lot of, a lot of efforts being put into making us, uh, uh, you know, less energy consumptive. Right. But here come all these desal plants. Is there a, a federal guideline or a, you know, um, regulation or yeah. program that our government could fall back on to insist that the desal plants that are put in here are energy efficient? Um, I don't know. But one thing I will say, however, is one of the reasons for showing you that um, solar case, right, was to basically show that you can produce desal, especially in island environments, on a scale for potable water and communities that don't have to be driven by imports. Yeah, I've been here for only 30 years. I've been here for only 30 years, so I'm new. <laughs> so, right? You know? So, right? And the grid is not the same. And by the way, I think you're confused about the Caribbean. It's only really sunny there for about four months of the year, not eight. It's not. You've been there, right? Yes. It's not. Okay. <laughs> right? Most of those places are, in fact, cloudy from May to December. Very uncertain source. Right? So one of the things, though, is I'm not arguing that, in fact, you go, oh, great, desal is going to solve our problem. You have to ask, how do you offset peak times of use? but not make it into a way of life. Now, we tend not to be very good as humans in slowing us down that way. But you're going to have to find that sort of source. You know? We do it in energy right now, right? We do thermal offsets with different kinds of energy right now. But I'm not the biggest fan of moving towards desal. What I'm basically showing is that you have flexibility within the system to offset Yeah, yeah, so, so the state, um, the Fish and Wildlife Service there in the state is really very heavily focused on one of the biggest issues we have in the summertime, as I was showing, is fish gills in streams that are completely devoid of vegetation, right? Basically, large die-offs during heat waves because of low flows during drought, and what they're bas trying to do is on specific rivers go back to revegetating riparian lands to keep the near shore cooler areas for salmon and other species. Yeah, yeah. I know that the relationship between the surface area of vegetation is directly related to how much precipitation goes back into the groundwater system. Yeah, and yeah how much it runs. Yeah. We don't have glaciers and we don't yeah, have Yeah, I know, I know. That's a, that's a huge deal. And so a lot of vegetation, so let me rephrase this, very little vegetation uses more water. There are some species that actually right, use more right, water. Right, 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 right. Less than what it collects and 
Right, right. I got you, yeah. Yeah, I got you. And so that vegetation to me is, is a key on how we yep. get out of where we are now. Yeah. And planting it in riparian yeah. areas and wetlands, not clearing it and planting native vegetation in those areas is, is, a, is a major, yeah. fairly simple thing we can do. And completely justified in the scientific literature. Yes. Right? So again, we come back, and I fully agree with you, that the type of question that's being raised is, we're trying that, we're doing a lot of this. To what extent, um, you know, how, how do we in fact make what we know closer to what and we do? so the conservation so. district would be one of the sponsors. Yeah, yeah, this, yeah. Because then working with private property owners yep. to do that very Understood, yeah. We, we have the same so going on in Colorado. So there a way somehow to provide a tax break? Right. Right. Could you potentially you know, help them give them some sort of tax break? Because that, that's like you said, a one-off. That's what yeah. you Yeah, yeah. Right. Uh, the, the finding the right incentives, I think, is, is exactly the question. The issue I wanted to get at, to which you raised, is you see the value in the vegetation. They see the value in not having it, <laughs> right? And so... The issue is, how much resources do we have in order to provide paid for incentives like that? And so they have to be behavioral, right? I mean, like I was mentioning about the desal issue. Efficiency is way more, right? Beneficial in terms of use, in terms of benefits, in terms of what you can produce out of it. But unless you have um, something to back you up, when it's short, people will go, that didn't work. That's what ends up happening in practice. They'll go, oh, you told us to be efficient and all this. We have a drought and we don't have water, thanks to your efficiency. And what you want to do is to be able to set, uh, set the bust times enough, but not create it as the way you, you act and run. But I'm just saying that's exactly as you say. People have different views about what those outcomes are and what actually constitutes how those change and how we come to agree on what the right thing to do is based on our incentives, but it's based on being honest about the barriers we face for our upfront choices. So. Can I just do uh, one more sure. question? Sure. It's a great question. One more. Yeah, go ahead. It's a great question because I had an answer. Yeah. So. yeah. Yes? Um, okay, this is a combo of thank you for helping us understand the duality of economic versus love versus incumbents and voters and the complexity of the situation. Yeah. water for San Francisco and yeah. the surrounding area, and you have 3.5 million people who are not visiting the national parks, vying for the water rights, and then you have the national parks working on these education programs, yeah. which I yeah, know happen to be a part of that conversation. Oh, good. Uh, so, so what I'm pointing to here is not just, because uh, I'm not speaking on behalf of my agency. Okay. I'm speaking on behalf of the entire research community in which I play a role, which is cross agencies and cross several nations, right? The work is underway already in terms of diffusing knowledge about where things have worked, but being very careful about where they might not work in other situations where context really matters. A big part of teams that I've helped set up across the US, of which the one in Washington, the Climate Impacts Group, and then the one in Oregon was one, all right? I helped de develop them, was to create the mechanisms for making people more aware of avenues for collaboration and for making the risks and the benefits of where they live transparent. That's basically been set up in different parts. Are we doing the best job you can of it? No. Is it really only about communication? No, it's not. 
right? It's really about, about, as people know, the things that drive fundamental vulnerability are beyond communication. They're ingrained in our be behavior, right? It's really